Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Steve Wu of Rambus. We're going to talk today about how to improve performance and power beyond just scaling. So Steve, as we start moving down to each new node, we don't necessarily get the same kind of benefits that we got in the past. In the past, you've probably got 50% improvement in both uh, power and performance. Going into the future, you may only get as little as 15 to 20%. This has pushed the whole industry into different architectures. And one of the big problems that we're dealing with is we now have lots and lots of data. So what has to change? Yeah, that's a great question, Ed. So yeah, what we're seeing is that architectures are now responding to this deluge of data by adapting and becoming more data aware and more data centric. And so what we see is uh, it's really an exciting time right now because architectures are changing and new technologies are gonna be coming out in the next few years. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you some slides that talk about some of these evolutions and some of the really interesting technologies that are coming out in the future. Okay, let's dig into this. Steve, what are we looking at here? Well, this slide here shows really a roadmap over the next few years of some of the big changes that are coming that are going to help uh, both uh, servers themselves and whole data centers respond to uh, the need for uh, better performance and power efficiency because of the larger amount of data that's, that's gonna be coming. So on the left here on this first panel, we actually see one of the new exciting technologies that's going to be debuting pretty soon here. It's a transition to the next type of memory, DDR5. Now, what DDR5 brings to us is more performance, the ability to move data at much higher speeds to compute engines like the CPU so that data can be processed. Uh, and what's exciting about it is um, it's an evolution over the existing DDR4 architecture, so it'll be compatible with the infrastructure we have today. And what you'll see is you'll see people use that to get both higher capacity and higher bandwidth. Um, what we'll also see is you'll see better power efficiency as well. And because we're able to drive the data um, at lower power and we're able to save energy for the amount of work that we're doing. In the middle panel here, we see another type of technology that's gonna be debuting next year which is um, a new type of link called the Compute Express Link or CXL. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But what CXL allows you to do is it allows you to uh, put other types of memory directly onto the CPU. So it, what it means is in addition to that directly connected memory that we're used to seeing today like DDR4, um, you're gonna actually be allowed to put additional DDR memory on these CXL links to increase both the capacity and the bandwidth that's available to the CPU. But those links are very flexible. They'll also allow you to put other things like storage class memories on there, uh, and maybe even non-DDR types of memories as well. So you'll really be able to tailor um, some of the uh, type of expansion capability that you have on those CPUs to meet the needs of your workload. And then further out on the right is we're seeing um, this capability that's being developed to go to what's called full disaggregation. And what that can do is instead of having our resources tightly coupled inside of a server, so some number of CPUs, some amount of memory, some disk and all that, um, instead of them all being captive within individual server boxes, what we do instead is we pool those resources. And what we can do is when we have a job that comes in, we can really tailor the resources that are used to attack that job. So for example, we, we might have one type of job that needs just a single CPU, but a lot of memory and a lot of storage. What we do is we allocate them from that pool for that job, and then we give it back when we're done. At the same time, you might have another job that has uh, a lot of compute requirement, but very little memory and storage requirement. So you might assign two or four CPUs out of the pool, but much less memory and storage. So what server disaggregation allows us to do is it allows us to improve the total cost of ownership because we're able to draw from pools that increase the utilization of those resources and they're more closely matched to the jobs when they come in. So now what you've done is you've taken some of the big issues that have been in, involved in chip design for years and you've moved them out of the chip and out 
really out of the server and now looking at everything as a system. That's correct. Yeah. I, I think um, what's really interesting is that these two evolutions really go together. So, um, you know, we're familiar with uh, virtual machines and virtualized infrastructure. That was really a great first step to improving total cost of ownership. You know, back around the year 2000, when virtualized infrastructures were, uh, were coming into the market, what we saw is that they greatly increased the utilization of hardware and that improved TCO. And that worked really well to a point, but we're seeing now the need for the next step in trying to improve TCO. And we're seeing that pooling of these resources is very important. And I wanted to kind of illustrate um, in the particular case of memory, why this is such a powerful idea. So if you actually take a look at the cost of components that are in a server, um, this pie chart that you see on the left, it comes from a report that was published recently by the Semiconductor Research Consortium in the beginning of this year. In the decadal plan for semiconductors, they talked about the importance of the component costs. And in particular, you see that in typical servers, um, DRAM memory is about half the cost of the server. And why that's important is that, you know, I mentioned that different jobs come in different flavors. They have different resource needs. Now, the way data centers are put together today, you pretty much have a fixed amount of DRAM that you put into every server. Sometimes your jobs don't need that much DRAM. And that means that in those servers where you're putting small jobs, that DRAM is going to waste. And it really isn't a big deal if the resource that you're wasting doesn't cost very much or doesn't have a high um, you know, price to, to actually operate it. But when you're talking about a component that's half the cost of a server, it gets to be a potentially a big issue. And especially at the scale we talk about in data centers where we're talking about tens of thousands of servers or more, and you may have many tens of data centers around the world, this kind of thing really can add up. And what you'd rather do is find a way to, if you can, is to really pool your DRAM resources and really only borrow what you need. And that will give you a better kind of resource utilization. One of the problems that you run into here is that anytime you go off chip, you have a latency penalty. How about when you go off server now, do you have a bigger latency penalty and how do you solve that? Yeah, and uh, definitely one of the challenges here is trying to manage um, if some of your memory is directly attached to the CPU and some of that memory is borrowed in a pool, then you can think about your memory system as really being composed of multiple tiers. And there are some interesting research questions that are out there. Um, and so let me switch to my next slide here and, and talk about what some of those things are. So, you know, I've kind of shown you on the left here, this notion of um, how you might think about uh, disaggregating your resources into different pools. On the left is um, a diagram that was shown recently by Microsoft and some of the research they're doing. And what they're looking at is um, different, uh, different racks uh, of, of resources where you might have CPUs in one rack, memory in another, and other high value resources like GPUs and, and IO devices um, in, in their own racks. And like you mentioned, um, you know, the memory, if it's far enough away, if the rack is, is far enough away, it can have a latency impact. And so you really have to think a bit about how you structure your applications and whether or not your applications can really benefit from an architecture like this. Is there a way of accelerating and adding acceleration into this so that you can actually speed up the movement of data? Yeah, that's an open research topic right now. That's right. So, um, there is a lot of work going on to try and understand what the best way is to make use of these multi-tiered uh, kind of memory systems. And um, what I'd say right now is it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but it's an area of active work in the industry. So what we're showing here on the right is um, the Compute Express Link uh, standard has actually done a nice job of anticipating not only the needs in the near term for expanding capacity and bandwidth in a server, but also thinking about how to support this notion of disaggregation and memory pooling. So on the right here, you see a couple of different possibilities for how we might pool memory. Uh, what we see on the top of this diagram is uh, on the top here of each of these little pictures are some small blocks and they represent compute nodes. And connected through a CXL switch are many memory nodes. 
And in this particular half of the diagram, you can see in the gold here, this compute node is actually borrowing the memory in two of the memory nodes. And you see some of the other um, compute nodes are borrowing memory in other memory nodes. What we can also do is think about sharing at a finer granularity. So on the right here, what you see is that some of these memory nodes actually have their memory split in terms of who the capacity is being loaned out to. In this particular memory node here, what you see is some of that capacity is going to the gold colored compute node and some of it's going to the purple colored compute node. And so there's uh, really a lot of work going on now to try and understand what are the best ways to share that. And some of the interesting problems that come up um, are really thinking about, you know, what's the best way to make use of this disaggregation to achieve better total cost of ownership um, at scale. Um, also on the, you know, the application side, really how did developers and compilers and OS and hypervisor writers, how do they take advantage of this disaggregated infrastructure? It's not clear that there's any one solution that's always gonna work the best. And so there's a lot of work going on now to try and figure out, you know, maybe there's a small set of models that are really the right way to think about it. And, and closely coupled to that is really how do these subsystems present themselves to the user? There's um, you know, some work that's been done in exposing some of the finer details about the multiple tiers of memory. And in other cases, you don't want to expose that to a user. So there's questions about how you might hide that from the user as well. Again, active area of research, very interesting work going on in the industry. What you're doing though, is you're adding flexibility into what is a pretty much an application specific design, right? So that design doesn't change, but what goes on around that does potentially change. That's right. Um, you know, really, um, the the holy grail is if applications that exist today could be used as is on these types of architectures, and we can achieve, um, you know, good performance with TCO and utilization of resources and gains in, in in resource utilization. If we can do that, then we've really hit the home run. And going forward, uh, the question would then be, what are the right ways and uh, to expose this to the user? And what are the right library and support routines to provide to application developers so they can really take it uh, even better advantage of what this kind of architecture has to offer? Because a lot, a lot of these designs are very much customized for whoever's building them, right? So now what you're doing is saying, oh, we can extend this further than where it was designed. Right. And so I think um, this has really been traditionally um, one of the interesting problems that's been faced in the industry, especially for software. And we've seen this kind of thing, um, particularly in the high performance computing community, where there's a desire for the new architectures to run the previous applications well, but also for those people who really want to spend time really hyper optimizing their applications to take advantage of every last benefit they can, those details should be exposed to that class of user as well. And so, yeah, providing for both of those types of use cases is going to be important going forward. So this is a totally different take on Makamoto's way where you move from customization to more standardized approaches to problems, right? That's right. Really what we're seeing now is that um, the ability to think of beyond just an individual server and the ways we can think about rack and full data center architectures that are afforded by things like CXL and, and resource disaggregation, they now allow us to think about providing that whole spectrum of customization to general type of application development in a different way. And what you need to really enable all that is something like um, a, a very good link technology like CXL and this ability to do things like pool your resources so that you can also get good resource utilization and better TCO. Steve, this is starting to look a lot like memory as a service. Is that where we're, this is really headed? Yeah, that's a really great observation. What we've seen um, through the evolution of data centers is that um, composability and the ability to increase resource utilization has really driven um, the desire to use different resources more as a service than anything else. And what uh, pooling does, and in particular memory pooling, and it really allows you to think about memory as a resource that, that can be tapped on as a service 
as an application or a workload needs more memory, it just borrows it from the pool. And it's a really nice kind of convenient abstraction that fits in well with the way people have been thinking about data centers for the past couple of decades. So how does this play out in the real world? What, what does this actually look like in a data center? Yeah, it's a really good question. So what I'm showing on this slide here on the left, you see kind of the standard workhorse dual socket server that exists in data centers today. Um, what you have is racks and racks of these servers. And on the left, you see two CPUs in the server, and each of them has their own uh, locally attached memory. On the right there, what you see is what the, uh, the potential types of configurations are that can be uh, used in the future. And that's all enabled by things like CXL. And so um, what we have here is the ability not only to have just a standard dual socket server, this type one server, which I show on the top here, but because we have these expansion links with things like CXL, it means we can attach additional memory um, in different form factors. They could be in something that looks more like a DIM form factor. It could also be in something that looks like a PCI Express type of card. And what we can do then is our data center, we can uh, we can actually have multiple types of servers now, and they can be configured relatively easily through these uh, through these uh, coherent links that are supporting CXL. Uh, depending on the type of workload that you need, um, you might have some number of these Type One servers and another number of these Type Two servers. And because this is a, really an expansion link, it's pretty easy to reconfigure your servers as well. So you may have uh, changing needs over time. What that does, once again, is it provides a new kind of flexibility, and it also feeds in well to that desire to have memory and be more of a service where it's available for you on demand as you need based on uh, the ability to rapidly reconfigure your infrastructure. So in order to make this work, does some of the intelligence have to move out of the classic, this is in the server, this is in the chip, into some sort of network type of controller? Yeah, it's a really interesting observation that um, because we now have um, something like CXL and, and pooling, what that means is there's going to be more silicon in these additional devices. So um, CXL connected memory will have a CXL controller that will have um, its own memory controller, for example, and its own logic where we can actually put some additional smarts to do things like manage the movement of data, prioritize, uh, and even to um, allocate and deallocate resources as needed. And the same is really true in, if you think about a, a full memory node, you're going to have different people that want to get at those resources and it will allow us to make different types of prioritization decisions. So we'll see um, really for uh, really the first time in quite a while, you'll see some of that ability to manage a resource move away from being directly on the CPU. And that's really exciting because it, it does mean that um, some of the smarts is moving more into uh, these devices that are uh, interspersed throughout the data center. Steve Wu, thanks for a great explanation as always. Thanks very much, Ed.